Hi there, I welcome you to this course on radiation protection. This course will have two parts. Part one will be general radiation protection and the part two will be radiation protection with reference to radiation oncology, particularly the bunker design including neutron shielding. I will start with very basic things such as discovery of x-rays, radioactivity, etc. just for the sake of continuity. It all started in the year 1895 when Rongen, who was working with Kudich Chu, came across an unknown type of radiation that could affect radiographic plates. Because it was unknown, he termed it as X-rays. And that started one of the greatest discoveries in medicine, that is the X-radiation. The very next year, in 1896, Rongen presented it in a conference of anatomists and told them that they could see the internal organs without surgically opening the patient body. It was used for pre-surgical procedure the very next year and in the year 1901, Rongen received the first Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of X-rays and also for the use of X-rays. The very next year, Henry Becquerel came up with the discovery of radioactivity that is the spontaneous emission of radiation from radioactive substances. Subsequently, in the year 1899, Curie and Perry Curie came up with separation of radium from its parent elements. This resulted in the use of radium and radioisotopes in medicine. Radium was the, one of the first radioisotopes to be used in medicine for treatment of cancer. Let us now move on to X-rays and gamma radiation. Somebody is asking you what are X-rays and what are gamma rays? What would be your answer? X-rays and gamma rays are electromagnetic radiation and they are part of electromagnetic spectrum. As you can see here, the electromagnetic spectrum starts with radio waves, microwaves, goes on to infrared, visible, ultraviolet, and then X-rays and gamma rays. This radiation can be classified into two different ways. The first is as ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. Non-ionizing ionizing radiations are part of electromagnetic spectrum still like you saw radio waves, microwave, visible, ultraviolet and even infrared or non-ionizing radiations. They are non-ionizing because they don't have enough energy to knock an electron out of the orbit of an atom or a molecule. Ionizing radiation, on the other hand, have enough energy to knock an electron out of the orbit of an atom. I hope you know what is ionization. Ionization is removal of an ion electron from an atom. So once an electron is removed, the atom is no more a neutral atom. It is an ion carrying a positive charge and the electron is a negative ion. So you get a positive and negative ion here. X-rays, gamma rays, alpha rays, beta rays and neutrons are all ionizing radiation. They can produce ionization. The other way of classifying radiation is as particulate radiation and non-particulate radiation. Waveforms are non-particulate radiation. For example, X-rays, gamma rays are non-particulate waveform of ionizing radiation. These are packets of energy. What are they? They are just packets of energy and it is expressed in the form H nu e is equal to H nu where H is the Planck's constant and nu is the frequency of radiation. The energy of this can also be obtained e from the equation E is equal to Hc by lambda where C is the velocity of life, light and lambda is wavelength. Particulate radiation on the other hand refers to atomic particles electrons, protons, neutrons, alpha and beta radiations. You can also say that these electrons behave the, as waveforms, like they also have a wave nature. But we are studying radiation protection. These are out of scope of my lecture here. While learning about radiation protection, one of the important thing one has to know is the sources of radiation. One of the main sources of radiation is the background radiation. This background radiation can be classified into two. 
one has the natural background radiation the other one is the man-made background radiation let us look at what are natural and what are man-made background radiation i took this data from the us uh, ncrp report so it's mostly the us data to give you a caution it's not indian data or it's a us data and radon and thoron give rise to about 37 percent of the natural background internal is about 5%, space is about 5%, occupational 0.1%, industrial 0.1%, and man-made, which is basically medical, is about 48%. If you look at the same data in 1980s, the man-made medical is only some 15 to 20%. It has now increased to about 48% of the background radiation. Let us now look, have a closer look at what is this man-made medical radiation, which is contributing to nearly 50% of the total background radiation. If you look at, in that, 50% of the man-made is computed tomography, CT. This is again a US data, not Indian data or any other country. It's a US data where computed tomography gives rise to 50% of the uh, background radiation of the man-made background radiation. Conventional radiography fluoroscopy is about 10%. Interventional fluoroscopy is about 15% and nuclear medicine is about 25%. If you look at in another way, the total annual background in the US is about 6.24 millisievert. Millisievert is the unit we use. We'll look at it a little more closely later. Of the 6.24 millisievert, it's about 3.24 is natural and 3 is man-made. This is what about 50 and 48 percent, right, separation. The world average annual background radiation is about 2.4 millisievert. The annual background in Kerala, a southern state in India, has in some parts of Kerala has about 12.5 millisievert. And Ramsar, a city in the Caspian Sea in the northern Iran has recorded a maximum background of 260 millisievert. I think it's average about 10 and the maximum it has recorded is about 260 millisievert. The pie chart I showed in the earlier slide, I have now put it as a bar diagram to make you understand. The green ones are mostly natural background and the blue ones are man-made background. You can see radon and computer tomography contribute maximum and this picture is the she showed in kerala a state in southern india where the background radiation is higher it's about four to five times of the natural background in the previous slides we looked at the uh, sources of radiation particularly the background radiation we looked at uh, natural background radiation and man-made background radiation we will lo now look at radioactivity what is radioactivity? Radioactivity is a process whereby unstable atomic nuclei release energetic subatomic particles. These processes can be classified as to two. One is the natural radioactivity, the other one is the artificial radioactivity. What is natural radioactivity? The nuclear particles like the proton and neutron within the nucleus, they are in continuous motion, as a result of which energy is transferred from one particle to the another. In a radioactive nucleus, the nuclear particle gain enough energy to overcome the force of attraction between the particles and they escape from the nucleus and that results in radioactivity. And this process, which is a disintegration process, could emit either alpha particle or beta particle and gamma radiation. Mainly this natural radioactivity happens in atoms which are heavier, that is having atomic number greater than 82 because the forces of attraction between the particles are sufficient to escape. Hence, they are naturally radioactive, right? We looked at natural radioactivity. The next is the artificial radioactivity. Elements having atomic number less than 82 are mostly stable except for some exemption. One is the K40. You know, we also studied in our body, human body, we have K40, which is radioactive. And this has atomic number less than 82, but still radioactive. These atoms having atomic number less than 82 are mostly stable, as I said. The stable atoms have neutron to proton ratio 
almost closer to 1. I think it varies somewhere between 1.1 to 1.5 for the stability. So if you have by some means can disturb this ratio, that is the neutron to proton ratio, then you can make this atom an unstable atom, that is a radioactive atom. These stable atoms could be made radioactive, you know, how? By bombardment of neutrons or heavy energy, high energy protons, neutrons, alpha particles or gamma radiation. These artificially produced radioactive elements are used in several medical applications, particularly in radiotherapy and in nuclear medicine. There are four different ways of production of artificial radioactive substances or elements. As I said in my previous uh, slide, the elements are stable because they have the neutron to proton ratio closer to one. And I also said if you have a method of disturbing that, you can make it radioactive. So the first method we are going to see is the neutron bombardment or neutron capture, where you put a neutron into the nucleus from a, using a nuclear reactor, which is a source of neutron then the element becomes radioactive because it is now you have now disturbed the neutron to proton ratio by putting a neutron in one of the beautiful example for it is the cobalt 59 being bombarded with neutron to make it cobalt 60. in this process significant amount of energy is released this is called the q of the reaction this energy is not useful for us what is useful is that the cobalt 60 is a radioactive element that you got and this emits beta particle along with gamma radiation which is quite useful here you are bombarding a neutron into the nucleus neutron is neutral and it go, go it entering the nucleus is not very difficult whereas if you want to put a positive charged particle like proton or alpha particle then it will has to go through the atomic uh, orbital electrons and enter the nucleus which is positively charged so there will be a force of repulsion and it has to overcome that repulsive force also so in order to increase the energy of these particles they are accelerated so it's called accelerator produced radioisotopes cyclotrons are usually used to accelerate the charged particles like proton neutron triton alpha particle to a very high velocity and they penetrate the orbital electrons of the target atom and interact with the nucleus now they can enter the nucleus and make it radioactive the third method is isotope generator this is mainly because some of the radioisotopes used for in medicine like technetium 19nm have very very short half-life because of the short half-life of six hours or so it cannot be transported as such so what they do is usually they transport its parent element molybdenum and the daughter element technetium is in equilibrium so they the daughter element decays with the half-life of the parent and now this is transported as molybdenum to the hospital where they extract the technetium from it so this extraction procedure happens in a generator called isotope generator some people refer to us as technetium generator itself, but it is generally an isotope generator. You can also use it for some other isotopes. The next method for protection of artificial radioactive elements is also a reactor produced method. In this case, the nuclear fission fragments are found to be radioactive. When a fission happens in a nuclear reactor, neutrons are used to bombard the heavier uranium or plutonium nucleus like uranium-235 or plutonium-239 and the fission results in splitting this plutonium or uranium into smaller fragments and also releases gamma radiation and high energy neutrons. These fission fragments are found to be radioactive. This fission fragment could be krypton or barium or iodine or cesium but the issue is they are all together you have to have a method of separating them. Once you separate an isotope that you need, you can use that isotope. The yield from a fission fragment is represented by this double bump graph. As you can see here, the maximum yield is about 6% at mass number of about 100 and mass number of about 140. 
So this is probably where you get the cesium and the iodine as the fission products. Let us now look at radioactive decay. The law of radioactive decay states the rate of decay of radioactive atom at any instant is directly proportional to the number of atoms present at that instant. For example, initially you had n0 number of atoms and lambda is the decay constant. At time t, you will have n number of atoms which is equal to n0 e power minus lambda t. Radioactive decay is an exponential phenomenon and another term half-life is used to signify the rate of decay. Half-life of a radioactive isotope is defined as the time taken for a radioactive element to reduce to one half of its initial value. You know the equation for radioactive decay is n is equal to n0 e power minus lambda t where n is the number of atoms present at a time t, n0 is the initial number of atoms and lambda is the decay constant. In case the t becomes t half, the n will become n0 by 2, half of the original value. So if you substitute for t as t half and then n will be have to be substituted as n0 by 2, then your equation becomes n0 by 2 is equal to n0 e power minus lambda t half. Now, if you take logarithm on both sides, you cancel n0 and n0, take log on both sides, then it will be t half is equal to 0.693 by lambda or decay constant lambda is equal to 0.693 by t half. This is a very important relationship that you should remember. And the mean life of a radioactive isotope is equal to 1 by lambda which is equal to 0.144 into t half. So the mean life is 0.144 into half life. So you have to remember this point also. How do you measure radioactivity? You use the term activity and the unit for activity originally was curie. Radioactivity was curie. How much was 1 curie? 1 curie is equal to 3.7 into 10 power 10 disintegrations per second. People can ask why it is 3.7 into 10 power 10, why not it 3.5 into 10 power 10 or why not it 3 into 10 power 10, right? So people can have a question on this. It is basically because originally they used radium as the standard. One gram of radium emits 3.7 into 10 power 10 disintegrations per second. Therefore, 1 curie was defined as 3.7 into 10 power 10 disintegrations per second. In SA system of units, the newer unit, the activity, the radioactivity is denoted by becquerel. 1 becquerel is equal to 1 disintegration per second. So if you want to convert this into curie, uh, 1 curie is equal to 3.7 into 10 power 10 becquerel. You could also reverse Becquerel to Curie here, okay? Next, we will look at attenuation of radiation. If N0 is the number of photons interact with attenuator of thickness delta X, N is the number of photons that will interact and be removed, so N is equal to mu into delta X into N0, where mu is the linear attenuation coefficient. It is something similar to what we learned in radioactivity. The number of photons removed will be proportional to the number of photons that interact. So the attenuation follows an exponential pattern. N is equal to N0 e power minus mu x, where mu is the linear attenuation coefficient and x is the thickness of the material. The next important factor that we have to learn is the half value layer otherwise called the HVL. It is very important with reference to radiation protection. Due to the exponential behavior, any given thickness will attenuate the beam by the same factor regardless of the intensity of the beam. That means this is a graph that is drawn between intensity and the thickness. The thickness that reduces from 100 to 90, the same thickness will reduce it from 90 to 81. That is the 10% reduction. Okay. The half value layer, or some people call it half value thickness, is the thickness that attenuates the beam to 50% of its initial value. 
that is what is called the half valley layer for example here you can see that attenuates from 100 to 50 that's approximately 6 millimeter thickness is the half value layer the half valley layer can be determined by this equation original equation here if you go back to the previous slide is n is equal to n0 e power minus mu x if it is x is replaced by x half that is the half valley layer then n has to be replaced by n0 by 2 so at the half valley layer the number of photons will be half of the initial number of photons so n0 by 2 if you cancel this and up apply a take logarithm then it becomes half valley thickness is equal to 0.693 by mu where mu is the attenuation coefficient or attenuation coefficient is equal to 0.693 by half value layer there are a couple of important things about half valley layer that you have to remember in case of polychromatic beam like bremsstrahlung the second half valley thickness would be larger than the first half valley thickness you know why it is due to the beam hardening because it is polychromatic beam the first half valley thickness will remove most of the low energy photons so there is a beam hardening naturally the second half valley thickness will be larger this you have to be bear in mind particularly when you do the calculation for shielding thickness the second thing is measurement should ideally be done the half valley layer measurement should ideally be done in a narrow beam joint geometry to avoid the scattered influencing the result. Tenth valley layer is the thickness of the material that reduces the intensity to one half of the original value. It is also a very important factor, tenth valley layer, like half valley layer. We will be using this in radiation protection a lot, particularly in the second part when we do the shielding calculation. So, 10th valley layer, if you apply the same concept like half valley layer, 10th valley layer is equal to log 10 by mu, which is equal to 2.3 by mu. You can also bring in a relationship between 10th valley layer and half valley layer. So, 10th valley layer is equal to 3.3 into half valley layer. So, that is a very important relationship when you want to do the calculation. We have learnt about half valley thickness, 10th valley thickness, activity and all. We will also look at some of the quantities and the units. We will start with the exposure, go to absorbed dose and then go to equivalent dose and effective dose. What is exposure? Exposure is the quantity that is used to describe the output of an X-ray generator. I usually say exposure is the ability, ability of radiation to ionize air. It is otherwise the charge liberated by ionizing radiation per unit mass of air. It is measured in Rongen. The unit of exposure is Rongen. Rongen is defined only for photons and not for electron, proton or neutron. It is defined only for photons. And more so, it is defined only for photon energy of less than 3 MeV. So don't forget these things. Exposure cannot be used as a measure quantity for higher energies and also for other radiation like electron, protons or neutrons. The definition of exposure goes like this. It is the ratio of the total charge dq of ions of one side produced in air in volume element of air having a mass of dm. That is x is equal to dq by dm. The unit of exposure is wrong. The, in the older system of unit, the exposure is said to be one wrong end if one ESU of charge is produced in one cc of air at normal temperature and pressure. You need to specify normal temperature and pressure because if that changes, the mass of air in one cc will change. In the newer system of unit, the definition of exposure is the exposure is said to be one wrong end if 2.58 into 10 power minus 4 coulomb of charge is produced in 1 kilogram of air. Then it is said to be 1 wrong end. Please note again I say it is only defined for air and for X and gamma radiation and it is for energy lower than 3 MeV. The next factor we need to learn is absorbed dose. It is totally different from exposure. 
The amount of energy deposited per unit mass in any material is referred to as the absorbed dose. It applies to any radiation, as I said, measured in gray, and it is said to be the absorbed dose is said to be one gray if there is one joule of energy is absorbed by one kilogram of the target material. The older unit for this was RAD, radiation absorbed dose, which is equivalent to 0 0.01 gray. The difference between exposure and absorbed dose is very nicely explained in H.E. Johns. I like that uh, explanation. Exposure is something like a teacher taking a class. Absorbed dose is what the student understood. So exposure is the amount of ionization that is produced. Absorbed dose is the actual energy absorbed. Not everything, every exposure is absorbed, right? So this is the difference between exposure and absorbed dose. The next quantity is the equivalent dose. This is very important for radiation protection. It is denoted by H. It takes into account the effect of radiation on tissue by using a radiation weighting factor WR. The question here is very simple. Is getting a uh, receiving one gray of X radiation is equal to one gray of neutron. Will it have the same biological effect? The answer is simple no. So it depends on the type of radiation. So the dose received by someone as one gray of X-rays and one gray of neutron cannot be a total of two gray. So it has to be multiplied by the radiation weighting factor. And therefore, the dose equivalent, which is referred to as HT, is equal to sum of the dose by each type of radiation multiplied by its weighting factor. You must know what is the weighting factor for each type of radiation or the type of radiation that an individual is exposed to. The weighting factors have been listed in ICRP 60 and then it has been modified in ICRP 103. I hope you know what is ICRP. ICRP is the International Commission for Radiation Protection. They come out with periodical uh, updates and information on radiation protection methods, give recommendations to government on how the radiation protection should be implemented and what should be the values, etc. So in their publication, ICRP 60, they had given radiation weighting factor for each type of radiation for example beta is 1 alpha is 20 x rays 1 gamma rays 1 that is giving 1 gray of x rays equal to 1 gray of gamma ray but when it comes to neutron it follows something like less than 10 keV it is 5 between 10 to 100 keV is 10 100 keV to 2 mev is 20 in icrp 103 there is a small modification for photons it's 1 electrons and 1 Protons and charged pions, it's 2. Alpha particles and fission fragments is 20. Neutron, it is a continuously bell-shaped curve. I'll show you that in the next slide. This is the radiation weighting factor for neutron. You know how it goes. You can look at it here. For low energy neutron, it is much lower. It is even lower than 5. But when it comes to somewhere around... Um, 0.01 to let me say 1 or 100 MeV, the neutron did vary significantly and goes to a peak of 20 and then drops here. So you can look at this here. This is the radiation weighting factor for neutron for various energies. You have small empirical relationship here for less than 1 MeV. This is the empirical relationship. And for between 1 to 50 MeV, you have to use this. For greater than 50 MeV, you have to use this equation. So the radiation weighting factor for neutron changes with the energy. And it is very different from X and gamma radiation, which we regularly use for radiotherapy. The next one we have to learn is the effective dose. This effective dose comes with the concept that is the radiation received by each organ will have the same biological effect. For example, 
if one gray is delivered to thyroid and one gray is delivered to gonon will they have the same biological effect the answer is no each tissue behaves differently for each time the amount of radiation so this is taken into account by a factor called tissue weighting factor so it takes into account the varying sensitivity of different tissues to radiation using the tissue weighting factor and it's measured in sievert used when multiple organs are irradiated irradiated to different dose or sometimes when one organ is irradiated alone okay the tissue weighting factors for various tissues are listed in icrp 60 as well as in icrp 103 there are significant changes between icrp 60 and icrp 103 for example in icrp 60 they gave a tissue weighting factor of 0.2 for gonads but in icrp 103 the gonad uh, weighting factor has been considerably reduced to 0.08 as you can see here it's a very important change they have made from 0.2 to 0.08 in 103 uh, similarly for red bone marrow it was given as 0.12 it has come to 0.08 in publication 103 there is much changes in this but they have made significant change to gonads and bone marrow so we learned about exposure the unit being wrong we learned to absorb dose the unit is gray we learned about radiation weighting factor and the dose equivalent which is sievert i'm going to give a contradictory statement and yet regarding using the sievert and then tissue weighting factors we had the effective dose and again sievert being the unit sievert is the unit used when you multiply by radiation weighting factor or tissue weighting factor till then it is gray okay having said that we are going to make a totally different statement at the end this provides the summary of radiation unit quantities we learned so far number 1 is exposure the unit is wrong and is measured in coulomb per kilogram of air the second one is the quantity is dose absorbed dose and the older unit was rad radiation absorbed dose and in si system it is gray and we know how much is 1 gray it is joule per kilogram dose equivalent which is older unit is rem and the newer unit is sievert effective dose is again rem older unit and sievert is the newer unit icrp makes a very firm statement on the use of units by icrp con convention doses resulting in tissue reactions which is basically deterministic effects should be coated only in gray it should not be coated in sievert or if you want to include biological effect it has to be relative biological effectiveness weighted dose that is rbe weighted dose rather than sievert which is this reserved for clearly stochastic effect icrp states that the quantities equivalent dose effective dose with a unit with special name sievert should not be used in the quantification of radiation doses or in determining the need for any treatment in situation where tissue reactions are caused so never you sievert where you have tissue reactions to be caused and it has deterministic effect icrp further states that in general in such cases doses should be given in terms of absorbed dose in gray and if high elite radiations like neutrons alpha particles are involved an rbe weighted dose or rbe dot d in gray may be used it also recognized that many doses in literature are coated in sievert or millisievert because of the previous usage and the familiarity with the term many professionals they keep using this however icrp recommends not to use sievert for deterministic effect it is reserved for stochastic effect for low elit radiation the actual numerical value for either unit is the same thank you very much for listening to this lecture please do the assignments before you move on to the 
next lecture on radiation protection. Best wishes.